Wow, people, today is a fucking monster of a show. We have one of the world's best hypnotists and leaders in the field of mind science. If you've ever heard of neuro-linguistic programming, he founded that field of study and coined the term. So this is a big deal. We're dealing with a real term coiner right here. And this show is really Adam Gorightly's idea, but unfortunately we had to move the time at the last minute and he couldn't join us. So be sure to smoke a little extra smoke and drink a little extra drink in his honor. But let's get down to it, people. The human mind is an incredibly complicated system, but we do know some things. Humans have a tendency to fall into patterns or programs, for better or worse, and we're also greatly affected by things that happen on a subconscious level, of which we have little control. And my friends, these are the two aspects of the human brain that are the ones most often turned against us, where we find ourselves manipulated by a global elite, corporate marketers, or those with a deeper, more hidden understanding of how to push the monkey brain buttons. But instead of trying to change the machine or pretend that being aware means being immune to these manipulations, maybe we should learn the tools of the mind ourselves so we can press our own buttons to achieve our own desired outcomes. Maybe we can become the kings of our own consciousness, the masters of our own domains, and learn to fine-tune our own mental processes to work for us, to help us reach our goals and to find the path we came here to walk, and maybe then we can work towards being creatures of decisive action rather than slaves to perpetual reaction. Well, today's guest is the man with just such a plan. And he's here to put us on the path of positive thought and mental mastery. Richard Bandler is the founder of Neurolinguistic Programming and has spent a lifetime expanding and perfecting mental techniques like neurohypnotic repatterning, mental engineering, charisma enhancement, and hypnosis, among many other mental sciences. He's written dozens of books on the subjects, including Get the Life You Want, The Secrets to Quick and Lasting Life Change with Neurolinguistic Programming, The Secrets of Being Happy, The Technology of Hope, Health, and Harmony, and The Ultimate Introduction to NLP, How to Build a Successful Life. I'm psyched to have him here. So, Richard, welcome to THC. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. I mean, you're a a busy guy, and your videos of hypnotism are extremely powerful. But as I was saying in the intro, life is full of stresses and worries. I think a big problem is that people just aren't given the proper tools or proper education about the power of the mind and thought. And you've been looking into this for several decades. So, I mean, what do you think are some of the more important things people need to understand about their mental space? Well, for four and a half decades, what I've been trying to do is to look at the difference between successful people, whether they're successful at spelling or successful at, you know, being a billionaire or a baseball player, and find out the difference between how those people think and how other people are thinking, Mm -hmm. uh, people who are less successful. Psychology has always looked at people from the perspective of there's something wrong with them and that if you dredge into your childhood, you can find out where it started. It's kind of an archaeological dig. And if you mentally understand it, somehow or other, your problems will disappear. This has been tried for almost 100 years and just simply doesn't work. And so the tack that I took was entirely different. I started looking at what we do with our subjective consciousness, how you organize it to become more effective. Uh, And if you think about it, just what you were talking about, the body was really designed for us to be in stress a couple of times a month, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, a, a big cat jumped out of the woods and the, and the prehistoric man, you know, got an adrenaline rush and ran away. And now it seems like it happens every 30 seconds. And, you know, people, you know, can't misplace their cell phone and they get freaked out or suddenly the text message bell rings and people's adrenaline state goes up. So our our neurology is really designed to to function so that it it gets wound up and unwinds itself, you know, periodically. And this is happening to us all day, every day. And uh, I think just physiologically, if people don't learn to control their state of consciousness, that the side effects, I mean, you know, that even in 1955, the American Medical Association announced that there was a relationship between stress and health. What they haven't really examined is the relationship between happiness and health. And if we could make ourselves calmer and happier 
uh, without, you know, long involved processes. I spent a long time in India and almost every form of meditation you learned required hours every day and years of practice. Right. Whereas you bring somebody, you know, out of an audience like I do and put them in a deep trance and, you know, 30 seconds later they're in a deep state of relaxation. So I find the hypnotic process to be a very valuable one. If people can learn to hypnotically control their state of consciousness, their blood pressure, their ability to remember things, all the things that come as byproducts of the hypnotic process. Because to me, the word trance is synonymous with the word uh, concentration. So what I try to do is provide people the mental vehicles to reduce unpleasant things and to increase pleasant things by having a control system that runs their brain. Mm -hmm. that, it's super fascinating. I mean, I, I'm sure a ton of people have a vague understanding of neuro-linguistic programming, but I mean, how would you summarize it for an uninitiated listener? Well, let me sum it. Neuro-linguistic programming itself is the study of successful behaviors, and uh, whether it's you know, successfully knowing how and when to relax or anything else. In terms of most people having a vague understanding, I would include a lot of people who teach NLP in that category. <laughs> uh, that, you know, I've heard some people talk about NLP, and I have no idea what they're saying, the amount of jargon they use. And it's just very sophisticated. To me, in your mind, uh, the simplest thing to understand is, is like fear. Uh, I teach classes, a one-day class about, you know, people who are scared of spiders and snakes and elevators and heights, and they all share in one common thing, which is if I tell them I'm going to bring a 16-foot snake in the room, they start freaking out, and there's actually no snake. Sometimes I don't even have a snake to bring in the room. I just <laughs> talk about it, and people become upset. They start, you know, fretting. Uh, and what happens is just the big picture in their mind of the big snake is enough to get their neurology set off and the mental neurosaps is firing in such a way that they feel fear, mm -hmm. which means they're not really afraid of the snake. They're afraid of the idea of the snake. And most of the time, pictures, whether it's post-traumatic stress syndrome or, you know, or a fear of all kinds of things, most of the time people have larger-than-life pictures in their head. And those pictures are so big, they scare the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. And I teach people to shrink them down to the size of a quarter and blink them black and white very fast. And if you do that two or three times, when you go to try and think about the big picture, it just won't come. Uh, our neurosynapses are something we grow every night, millions and billions of them. And uh, when you're a baby and you sleep, you're growing probably five billion neurosynapses a night, and they layer on top of each other. But yet, they, they can fire from the beginning of one straight through to the end of another, even though there are billions of them, because chemically there's a difference in size. And when we take memories of really unpleasant events, and we take those memories and we shrink them down to a small size and we run them in reverse, so the events actually transpire backwards, but very fast, what happens is, is it flattens the neurons out. It doesn't have a psychological significance to it. It has a physiological significance. And most of the things in NLP are like 15-minute mental tricks that if you run through them, they get rid of a fear, they get rid of anxiety, they get people over bad past memories, and then some of them make it so that you can learn how to spell. I went and found somebody who won a spelling bee and started asking them questions, and it turned out they visualized all the letters about 16 inches high in their mind and, and check them against the paper. And when they saw a new word, they'd expand it in their mind and make a big 16-inch picture of it, make sure it matched the one on the page, and in the future they'd memorize it. And most good spellers do this, but in schools we teach kids to spell phonetically, which oddly enough can't be spelled phonetically. It actually <laughs> comes out pahonics. Uh, and NLP is really the study of the things that work versus the things that theoretically should work. Uh, as modelers, we're only interested in success. We're not interested in explanations. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I've also heard, you know, a lot of uh, Zen teachers, they talk about the more in the moment you can be, the less you freak out about the big picture. It's kind of what you were talking about. If you can shrink that down and not focus on the future, which is where most people's stress comes from, 
Uh, you, well, you might some be a people's happy. stress comes from the future and some it comes from the past. I know people that who have too, been yes. threatened over something that happened 25 years ago, and every day they think about it, you know, for two minutes here and a minute there. And I always get people to total it up. I go, you know, really in the course of a day, how many times do you think you think about it? And people mm -hmm. will say 50 to 100 times. And I go, for how long? And they'll go, you know, for two minutes. And you start adding it up, and it's like an hour and a half a day. And then I go, you know, if you multiply it by a week and then by a year, you start talking about 5,000, 10,000 hours. In 10 years, it's even more. And when you start to look at people and go, so your plan for the future is to worry about this one past event for 10,000 hours in the next 10 years. <laughs> and if they're 30 years old, they're going to do this for maybe 30 years. So we're talking 30,000 hours. They're planning to feel bad. And they don't think of it as planning, but actually it is. And when you get it in perspective, it makes it easier for people to start to shrink that down. And it's not enough to just stay in the moment because you got to have plans for the future and you got to remember the past. But you don't have to feel bad while you're doing it. And if you're looking at something the size of a quarter, you're not going to feel as bad as if you're sitting in the front row of the largest movie screen you've ever seen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's simple technologies like this. That, that allow people to take control of their thoughts. The same thing is true about the volume of voices and the location of voices and, and also our feelings. Most people act like their feelings are not something they can control when actually it's based on the entemic nervous system, which is all the connections between hollow and solid organs in your intestines. And they used to think that just had to do with digesting food, but when a psychologist talks about you're feeling angry, really what's happening is your feelings are moving in a specific order inside your body, which is different than when you're hungry. And when you're feeling terrified or when you're feeling anxious or when you're feeling nervous or when you're feeling happy, these are all particular orders of whether your feelings are spinning forward or tumbling back or going clockwise or counterclockwise, because those are really the only four directions you can go in. And when you take people and you have them, when they start to feel anxious, if you have them spin their feelings faster, it gets worse. And if you have them slow it down, it gets better. And if you have them force it and spin it in the opposite direction, Typically, they can't go back and feel bad about the same thing ever again. And we've been developing these kind of techniques. Uh, I've been doing this for 45 years, and I've taken thousands of psychiatric clients over the years who, you know, have been through years of therapy and in matters of an hour or two hours got them to stop fretting over something. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they become the smartest candle on the cake, but if somebody has been paranoid about the same thing for 20 years and you can get rid of it in 30 minutes, uh, typically a psychologist will turn and ask me, what do you do if it comes back? And I look at them and go, do it again. Right. Uh, whereas to them, they think this is covering up something and there's some deep buried thing that must be unraveled for you to have a happy life. And in the four and a half decades I've been doing this, I've had depressives that have become comics. I've had all kinds of examples of things, which have proved to me that's just not the case. Uh, there, are, there are probably people who need some kind of chemical treatment who are very bipolar or something. But 99% of the time, what people need to do is to learn to control their thought patterns and their physiology enough that they can get rid of most of their bad feelings because they're never going to get rid of them all. And there are some things you should be terrified of, especially when investing money. And uh, to me, you know, learning to pay attention to good intuitions and bad intuitions is how people get smarter. I feel like my career has been a battle against stupidity for uh, decades and decades. And that if I can get people to be less stupid and to be smarter more of the time, they'll have pretty good lives. <laughs> well, that is what I would ask, is if these techniques do have such a high success rate, why are they still considered so fringe? Well, it depends upon what country you're in, just to start with. The United States is a huge country, and it has very strong establishment. They've, they've bootlegged a lot of what I do into what they call cognitive psychology over the years. And a lot of the techniques, you know, I mean, things like how to spell are taught in some places and not others. I mean, I lived, in, I lived over in England for about 10 years. I actually lived in Ireland for 12 years. And I taught in England and in Europe. So you find in England it's becoming more prevalent. They did uh, a study at some of their school systems and found out that the way we teach teachers works better 
that actually all the students improve about 30 percent. So they started spreading it through the school system. But again, there's a shortage of people that know how to teach this. Uh, I'm, I've certified over 100,000 people, but most of them work as personal coaches or they work at big corporations. Uh, there's a woman named Kate Benson who's working in the school systems in England and Turkey and Germany, I think. And slowly all this stuff is going to find its way into the school. I mean, four decades is not a lot of time, you know, to turn over a whole field like psychology and get people to start uh, accepting things. I mean, the school systems are trained to teach what was. Uh, they're still teaching Freud when he really never did very well with any of his clients. Uh, you know, the, the emphasis on repeating past mistakes because that's what the people who are still doing it learned. Uh, but yet in the United States, I've had tens of thousands of people in seminars, so there's a lot of people using it and a lot of people talking about it. Uh, you know, I, even Tony Robbins, who knows very little about NLP, did extremely well. Uh, he sold zillions of tapes and, uh, you know, and almost everybody on the planet knows his name. Yeah. Uh, my goal has been to teach a small group of people very well so that the information doesn't die. And uh, I've done a good job of that. We have lots of certified trainers. It's very, very big in Japan. Uh, the Japanese have probably more institutes than America. I think there's uh, something, there must be 300 certified trainers in Japan alone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are different North Korea, or not North Korea, South Korea. It's becoming very big in South Korea. And there are trainers in Malaysia. We have people doing training all over the world now. Uh, in the United States is funny because it's such a huge, huge market. It's very hard to break in and make an impact that everybody knows about. And, uh, you know, I've been at this for four decades, and there are lots of people in America doing NLP in various forms, and some of them don't even know what it is. I've worked with the government. We redesigned training programs for the pistol shooting and for uh, the M16 training about 25 years ago. And most of those people left the government and got jobs somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the way corporations are. If somebody is successful at a corporation, they end up getting a job at some other place doing something else. You know, if you're a successful engineer, you end up being middle management, uh, probably something you know nothing about. Uh, it's just the way things are and the way information flows. But now that there's all these e-books and there are computer programs, uh, I expect that you'll find a lot more NLP. It's on TV all the time. The CSI guys talk about it. You know, I see it all over the place in places I wouldn't expect it. I mean, especially coming from me, you know, having started in a room by myself with a bare light bulb typing away on a manual typewriter. Uh, there's been an explosion of information in the past four decades. Right on. Well, let's talk about some of these big stresses in people's lives. Um, probably money and career path are obviously huge ones. I mean, most people I know are stuck on a hamster wheel at either a dead-end job or one that they aren't passionate about. And there's a lot of fear built up around abandoning that for something more fulfilling um, how can these kind of mental techniques help someone to gain the life they want? Well, to start with, you know, to change your life, you, you need to reduce your worry because worry just takes a lot of time. If you start saying to yourself, well, I should quit my job and find something I love doing, to start with, that's the wrong order, just that, right out of the cake if you think about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, become unemployed with no resources and then try to build a life is the wrong way to go about it. What you need to do is to build something that has a transition model in it. I mean, a lot of people who have started doing NLP had jobs doing something else. They either worked at corporations, they were architects, some were medical doctors and just hated it, or Obamacare was on the horizon. Uh, my dermatologist just quit. He's 55 years old and figured out he couldn't be a doctor by himself anymore. He had to join some big organization, hmm. or he had to go out and spend 100000 on computers and hire two people just to keep track of the stuff to do Obamacare, when all he normally does is walk in, look at your skin, freeze a few things, and, you know, if you have some kind of skin disorder, he knows them all because he's done it a long time. And he just quit. He just huh. said, this is not for me. And, uh, you know, instead he wants to go and get trained to do something else. Now, he's lucky because he's got a pile of money to fall back on. He could learn to be anything. He could go be an airline pilot. Uh, 
but not most people aren't in that position. So right. the first thing you have to do is get rid of all the scary pictures because they're nothing more than scary pictures. And then you have to figure out where you are and where you would like to go. Now, if you know where you want to go, then you build a transition model, a series of steps by which you could logically move from one place to another. And the name of that is called thinking. Uh, <laughs> most people spend most of their time remembering and calling it thinking. That, you know, they, they remember seeing people there. They remember not having money. They remember being unemployed, you know, for three months and how horrible it was. And they go, if I quit, I'm going to be that bad off. Well, that's not really thinking. That's just really remembering. And if you make a wild fantasy of horrible things happening and your wife leaving you and you're losing your house, and then you remember it, that's not thinking either. That's remembering. But if you really do adequate planning and you lay out in your mind what it would take to successfully move from one career to another, and it doesn't mean it'll be easy. You may have to go to school at night. Uh, one of my relatives is stuck in a very dead-end job. It couldn't be more of a dead-end job. He works on the docks loading boxes. And now that he's 35, it's crossed his mind that he can't do this forever. <laughs> Plus, he's got three kids. And I said, you know, there are jobs, entry-level jobs, where people make, you know, they do x-ray technicians. There are people who, you know, uh, build prosthetic limbs for people. And, you know, it's our two-year programs. And if he, you know, buckled down and went to school at night, it would be very difficult. But two years later, he's going to be able to get a job where he's making three times as much money as he is now just to start with. Uh, you know, and, you know, it would be more satisfying. You know, I think of all the people coming back from all these crazy-ass wars with limbs ripped off. Right. Not to mention the amount of people that do it naturally without being in the Army. Yeah. I mean, well, if someone has a lot of doubt in these techniques, is there are there any small things you would suggest people start out with so they could test these methods personally? Well, the first thing to do is, you know, is to think of something that you think about way too often and it makes you feel bad. And typically for most people, it's something that happened in the past. They either made a mistake or somebody else screwed them over and they think about it and they think about it five times a week or 30 times a week and it drives them nuts. Now, if you take that memory and you look at it exactly the same way, it will make you feel just as bad. You can look at it, and the bad feeling will come. It's like clockwork. Now, if you take the same thing, and you have to do this real quick, you have to make it suddenly shrink it down to the size of a quarter and go blink it black and white, then open it up at the end and run it backwards so it's like a Charlie Chaplin movie. Everybody walks real fast, talks backwards, and run it back to the beginning. Then you wait five seconds, take a deep breath, and go back and look at it again. Nine out of ten times, it won't make you feel bad anymore because you've interrupted the normal neurological processing. Now, if you can do that in 30 seconds or a minute, what it means is, is there are all kinds of things about your brain that you don't know that will stop your bad feelings and a whole lot that will give you good feelings. Most of my books are like cookbooks. You, you know, you get the life you want, you look up something, it takes you 15 minutes, you do it, and it makes you smarter. It makes you stop worrying about this, or it makes you, it's broken into three pieces, how to get over things, how to get through things, and how to get to things. Uh, the new book that I just came out is called uh, The Ultimate Introduction to NLP, mm -hmm. and it's actually a story of somebody going to a seminar and learning these techniques. So it really is like watching an hour TV program. You identify with the main character, and you walk away with skills that you can use. This isn't complicated stuff. It's not like learning to meditate or play a musical instrument. This is actually something you're doing every day, but you're not controlling. Uh, most people think about things, but they don't think about how they're thinking about them. They don't think about whether the picture is on the right or the left, how big it is. I mean, if you think about whether, if you ask yourself the question, do you believe the sun is coming up tomorrow? Uh, you know, most people have a great big picture of the sun coming up. It's in a particular place in their mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start to think about the things you believe, like you can't be successful, well, those all of those doubtful, bad the beliefs that give you strong feelings are all in the same place in your mind. And if you learn that they're there, then what happens is, is you can take them and move them somewhere else. You know, there are some things that you just don't hardly believe at all. 
And when you look at it in your mind, pictures will be in one place as opposed to another. The voice will either be on the right or the left, the front or the back. And when you start cataloging how you think, then you start being able to adjust it so that you can start to believe what you want to believe. And it affects your neurology. Uh, your ability to, to, to have motivation is based on what you believe is possible. And if you have, if you have certainty about your doubt, uh, that's kind of paradoxical in and of itself. I mean, people who come into me and say, I'm racked with uncertainty, I always look at them and go, are you sure? <laughs> and most of the time they say yes. And when I go, how can you be so certain about your uncertainty? And uh, when they start to think about it, you know, there is a place in their mind where certainty is. They just got all the wrong crap there. <laughs> and when you start moving shit around in your mind the same way you would in a filing cabinet, the only difference is, is that it affects the way you feel. And if you change the way you think, it changes the way you feel. And therefore, it changes what you can do. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, another thing I was curious about is have you or – have you heard of anyone or known of anyone doing research in these mental techniques in conjunction with psychedelics? The uh, reason, not the, on purpose. <laughs> the, the reason I ask is because uh, dimethyltryptamine and ayahuasca, a big part of that, people feel like they gain serious insights from those specific compounds, and they yes. always ayahuasca talk about it in a, a mental way. It's a nasty drug, actually. I know a lot of people that have been taking it, and... Uh, but, you know, it, to me, if you can do it with ayahuasca, you can probably do it without it. <laughs> you just read what people went through mentally. Uh, yeah, you know, with some people are so hard-headed, it probably took ayahuasca to get them to have an insight. <laughs> I mean, most of the people I met that flew down there and traipsed through the jungles, you know, I love that they take a machete and cut a place for the plane to run. Yeah. And they go in and some shaman who they don't even understand what they're saying, they have a translator translating how there's entities and plants. And, and they learn to see these things and use them for healing and all kinds of stuff that most of the people I've met, you know, are the ones that take a lot of convincing because they have a tendency to doubt everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you rack them with LSD or ayahuasca or one of these things, uh, they have a tendency to, to, what these drugs do is they make the part that keeps your senses closed down. If we didn't have uh, things in our brain, because like LSD, lysergic acid, actually is what opens up the senses. Like if there's danger and you get adrenaline, the amount of LSD in your mind increases, therefore you see more and hear more. That if there wasn't something that dampened our senses, we would become overwhelmed. Right. And, uh, and it's the interplay of, of the homeostatic system in the brain that allows us to find the balance. The problem is, is people become too fixed. They only see what they believe, and therefore they don't ever learn anything new. And uh, sometimes these drugs open the doorway long enough for people to peek out and discover, you know, that they've been overwhelmingly stupid for a long time. <laughs> that, right. you know, nobody knows the limits of possibility. Good Lord, my grandfather believed that no one would ever fly, you know. And then my father was one of those people that walked around going, you know, that's as impossible as putting a man on the moon. And every time we set the limits of what's impossible, we find out it really isn't, you know, with a concerted effort, impossible. But uh, we managed to do it in, you know, less than 10 years. We need to put our minds into making our population smart enough to keep up with our smartphones. <laughs> I notice they call them smartphones, not smart schools. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, yeah, maybe the psychedelics are a crutch or maybe they're just a way of diving in and maybe it is well, all. They're one, they're one way that, you know, I mean, psychedelics are a way to open up your senses so you perceive more and have new ideas. Right. Uh, it, but it's not the only way. There are yeah. certainly, you know, I do it with hypnosis all the time. I do it with neurolinguistic programming. I do it with design, human engineering, all of these tools, because remember, it's not the drug. It's the body's response to the drug. Mm -hmm. And when you take LSD, there's LSD in your brain already, but it's not producing as much. And by increasing that level, the body responds, and therefore your synapses start synapsing in a, in a new direction, and your eyes start perceiving new things, and you start to get ideas that you wouldn't have otherwise. And, you know, oddly enough, when somebody has taken one of these drugs, it's very easy to reinduce the drug state. Uh, even right, even right. things like sodium pentothal, 
uh, if somebody's ever taken sodium pentothal, in a matter of probably 15 minutes, it would take me to reinduce the state and put them back in it. Hmm. Because the body's thing. already memorized it. So, you know, their ability to reproduce it chemically is not that hard. We are strange machines. But, um, yes, yes far, we are. <laughs> let's talk about these techniques as far as uh, applications for le learning new skills. I hear that's kind of a big thing that you can use them for. Are there any real limitations to what they can do? I mean, can a clumsy person mentally transform themselves into a great athlete or a tone-deaf shower singer manifest a perfect pitch? Well, I, I, certainly not overnight. You know, this is what I hear. People come over time and they, they tell me, they go, I heard NLP could, you know, make you hit every ball that comes across the plate. Well, I've worked with great b baseball players, and so far we haven't figured out a way to do that. Right. Um, uh, see, what we can do is we can get the same mental state that somebody's in when they're doing well to be taught to people who are learning, so they're more likely to do better than they would. And this is true for musicians. This is true for artists. Uh, I do a class where I actually bring people in who claim they have no artistic ability. I put them into a trance, and I give them different strategies that I've gotten from good artists. And oddly enough, they can paint immediately. Wow. And, uh, and you know, I have a video with that on there called The Class of the Master. Uh, I've probably done this now for 20 years, probably two or three times a year. And I'm always shocked by how well people do that, that it, you know, our inhibitions stop us from trying. And if we don't have any mental capacity, and one of those strategies I got from a guy who was just walking down the Thames in London, and there was a guy drawing a tree on the other side of the river, and the drawing was identical to the tree. I mean, it was color pencils, and he was drawing it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I walked up and asked him, I said, how do you get the tree on the paper? And the guy goes, well, he goes, I just draw it. And I said, yeah. But I said, how does your hand know what to do? And he looked at me and he said, well, this is going to sound crazy. And I hear that a lot in my <laughs> business. But uh, what he did is he imagined his hand across the river, a great big hand, tracing the tree. And he saw a wire come from his hand attached to his real hand. So when the hand next to the tree moved, his hand moved on the paper. And when you think about it that way, suddenly drawing something on the outside becomes easier. That one little mental trick, you know, wow. and if I teach somebody who's never drawn to do that, to hallucinate this hand tracing the tree and doing the colors and color by color and switching from the color that they see across the river to that color of pencil and then just tracing or shading that part of the tree, Suddenly, the tree they draw may not be as good as the artist who is on the Thames, but it certainly is 15 minutes later better than they could have done. And if they keep doing that, they keep getting better. And as you keep adding those techniques so that you have a whole repertoire of them, not just the one with the wire, but ones about color and ones about shading and all the details, uh, some artists are able to look at very small things and magnify them as if they have a magnifying glass. Most people who do carving do that. They don't teach you this in art school. When I went to school, they just handed us big giant crayons and said, draw this. You know? And that's the <laughs> same way they used to do training in baseball teams. They would hand you a, a baseball and a bat, and they'd go out and say, hit some. Uh, they wouldn't tell you how to slow down time so the ball isn't moving as fast. They wouldn't tell you how to make the ball appear bigger, how to see which way the ball is spinning so that you knew which side of the ball to hit it on, that many sports have become much more of a science than they ever were. And a big part of that is what NLP has done for them, teaching them to repeat positive states of consciousness so that people have a sense of time distortion when they need it, and, you know, most of these baseball players go out and they hit their foot with the bat and they step into the batter's box. And then they step back out and step back in. Even golfers, when they look down the fairway and they make a fake stroke and they look down the fairway, when you start asking them, what are you looking for? How do you know when to hit the ball? Most of them will tell you the fairway starts to shrink. And when it gets to a certain size, they know they're going to hit it well. And if they hit it any other time, they slice it or do poorly. Man, where do you think that comes from? Are they doing that mentally? It's an altered state. Like I say, altered states are really concentration. I think most drugs help people to concentrate. And that it doesn't mean it's the only way to concentrate. 
but these that most athletic feats are done by going into a profound altered state. A prize fighter doesn't walk out in the same state of consciousness. He's, he's having lunch in. He learns to focus. When you look at them coming out of the ring, their pupils are dilated. They have to go into a state where they can maintain things like, and they're all hypnotic phenomenon. They have to distort time so that everything is going in slow motion. They have to do pain control, much like you do in hypnosis. All of these things that people do as athletes are a hypnotic phenomenon. Man, what do you think are some of the best ways to increase our concentration to work up to some of those higher levels? Well, I, I'm a great proponent of learning hypnosis. Uh, I, you know, meditation to me it takes a long time, uh, but when right. you, if you get somebody to hypnotize you into a deep trance and then give you the post-hypnotic suggestion, you can go back when you want to learn to count yourself in and out. You learn what hypnotic phenomenon are there. And we've gone a step further. In design human engineering, we actually build a control panel in the mind. So you can look down and you have a lever in your mind and you can just pull it and change your state so you go deep and one that increases serotonin and one that you know, increases your level of adrenaline and so that you can go into heightened states of awareness or deep states of awareness. And you can actually get an application for your iPhone and a little headset now called an X-Wave, and you can measure your brainwave patterns. When we hypnotize people, we don't just do it like you know, in the old days where they took a watch and spin it in a circle. We put on machines and we read people's brainwave patterns so we know exactly what state they're in. We know whether they're going into alpha, and when they get to alpha, whether there are theta spikes. And we know which states are better for what activities. Uh, and, you know, to me, you know, I've worked diligently for years to tie in the relationship between information gathering machines and giving people the ability to gather the same information with their eyes and their ears so that we become better communicators. Yeah, you know, every once in a while on this show, we'll have some guest from the New Age movement, and that's not really my favorite area. But um, when they're talking about manifesting reality and that kind of thing, do you think this is really what they're trying to describe? Um, I have trouble understanding a lot of what they say because they right. use verbs as if they're nouns. You know, when yeah. you start talking about reality as if it's a thing, as a physicist, I know better. I mean, you start looking inside things and there's nothing but smoke and mirrors and no mirrors and no smoke. But there are rules by which things operate. Gold melts at the same temperature every single time. And those rules change, by the way, depending upon what's going on. That's what, you know, when you reach a certain temperature, the laws of ohms and amps simply ceases to exist. It changes. And the more you study physics, the more you learn that there are rules in reality. But when the New Age people talk about it, when they start talking about manifesting a reality, uh, they don't get into the details of how you do it. How do you right. build a strong belief? I have a whole book that tells you how to go in and build better beliefs. And it's called Using Your Brain for a Change. <laughs> and uh, that book is dedicated to the idea that you can decide what you're going to believe and make it as strong a belief as anything else that you believe strongly. And it tells you exactly how to do it. And there's exercises by which you practice it. And the more you practice it, it's like anything else, the better you get at it. And if people decide this, and to me what manifests things with most of my clients who have failed at most of their things in life, except going to therapy, when they get to the point where they realize if you believe you're going to do something, then you try with every fiber of your soul and every fiber of your imagination so that you make plans and you carry them out. I don't think it's enough to just believe. I think you have to do as well. I think this is what makes me pop out of the side of the New Age movement. They don't put my books in the New Age department. Uh, you know, sometimes they call them self-help books, but really they're not about helping yourself. They're about transforming yourself. I'm in the business of optimizing people, not repairing them. Uh, a lot of what you look at in the New Age books are all about how do you fix yourself, how do you mm -hmm. overcome what's wrong with you. And I happen to think people work perfectly. The paranoid is paranoid every day. A person with an elevator phobia never forgets to be phobic of an elevator. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a great point. And but so anyway, what I try to do all the time is to just get people to 
to, to optimize what they have, take their assets and amplify them, take their deficits and shrink them down, and add other things so that they start to build better beliefs, so they have a better attitude, and to learn to control their feelings. And uh, a lot of the New Age movement acts as if your feelings are real, and they are real while you're having them, but they're not, they're, they're not real like gold melting at the same temperature. Right. You could look at it and hear exactly the same things and feel entirely different. It happens all the time. We change our taste for foods. Uh, we change what we like. We change who we like. All of these things change, and they change over time. Being able to do it on purpose is called thinking. And when you know how to think on purpose, then you can change the way you feel, and therefore it changes what you can do. Yeah, I mean, one of my biggest problems is probably procrastination. It's a widespread problem. But I mean, you never wait to procrastinate. Right. That's a good point. I mean, it's just, what is it? It's, e it's so easy for me to bust my ass for eight hours a day when my boss is telling me what to do, but when it comes to working on things I'm passionate about that I'd rather be doing, apparently, it's a huge undertaking to get started. What's going well, on there? It, it, well, I don't know what's going on. A psychologist <laughs> would be interested in that question. I'm only interested in how you start doing things. That's I mean, a better if question. if your boss tells you to do something, how do you think about it? where? How do you start doing it? Yeah, it's, do you have it's, a clear picture in your mind of what you need to do? Most likely, yeah. Okay. Is it on the right, the left? Well, me personally, it's just uh, it's I'm on such autopilot there that I just kind of go for it. Um, well, I, 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 you can say that, but it's not true. No, See, you think there's more of a process involved? Well, I know there is. I've been doing this for a long time. And, and In other words, for you to carry out a task, you have to know what the task is, and you have to... You, ha you have to just make the plan somehow. You either have to visualize what you need to do. You probably have a voice that tells you that you better get started. And you have a certain set of feelings that, that propels you into the act action. Right. And I guess the goal is to harness right, that. Just pick, and one, in pick an example in your mind. What's something that you actually do when you're supposed to? When it's morning, do you procrastinate getting out of bed? <laughs> it depends on the day of the week, but usually yes. Okay, so, so it's a big uh, procrastination problem. It starts from the moment big I wake up. Procrastination problem. Okay, so well, no matter how long you procrastinate, there's a point at which you actually get up. Right. Correct. Yes. Okay, so let's just back up a little bit. How do you know when it's time to get up as opposed to time to procrastinate? You got up this morning, right. and when you got up this morning, what did it take to get you out of bed? Because if the picture isn't big enough, if it isn't close enough, if the voice isn't loud enough then you don't have strong enough feelings that you get out of the bed. Some people just see themselves getting out of bed, and they get up. Uh, those people have a tendency, by the way, to be afraid of heights. Really? Yeah, because if all it takes for you to do something is seeing yourself do it, if you see yourself jumping off the edge of a building, you're in deep trouble. Ah, good point. Well, I find it all the time when people tell me they're afraid of heights. I always look back at them and say, so in the morning when you wake up, you get right out of bed, don't you? And they typically say yes. And that's because it makes sense. It's a logical thing. If your motivation is too easy, then you get scared in certain situations just because your mind can run. Because instead of seeing yourself stand calmly by the side of the building, you see yourself flying off. And that would be frightening. If you do everything you visualize, uh, that can be a scary thing. And, yeah. uh, but in your case, it takes a lot to do it. So <laughs> once you know how big that picture is and how close it has to be, uh, tomorrow when you wake up, make the picture bigger and closer, faster. And whatever side of your head the voice is on, make it louder and closer, and you'll find yourself getting up quicker. Yeah, that it, it's starting to make more sense to me. It seems like it's a little bit well, easier to... Well, you're either going to wait till it happens by itself, you know, or you're going to make it happen yourself. It, it would be like having a remote control and not using it, just hoping the TV would change yeah. channels. Yeah, and I mean, I have heard you say that a big part of pe why people don't get what they want is because they're not determined enough. I mean, well, determination is like anything else. You can turn it up and turn it down. All of our feelings are something that run by themselves. Like if you have a feeling that you really want something, well, if you spin that feeling fast enough in your body, there's a threshold point at which you just go do it. And if it goes on at a low rate, then you don't get enough juice to actually get going. 
I mean, I've had people walk in my office and go, for years, I've wanted to learn to play a musical instrument. Now, here's the odd thing. For 10 years, they can keep track of what they want to do. They imagine themselves doing it, but yet they never pick it up and try, let alone try hard enough every day. Because there are a lot of really intelligent people who don't learn to play, who don't learn to do things they want to, and a lot of complete idiots that learn to do them because they're very determined. Right. And uh, being very determined is not something that's genetic. It's, there isn't a determination gene. It's a thought process. And if you learn to engage in the process on purpose and run your mind on purpose, then you'll get the feelings and you'll do the activity. Yeah, I've heard you describe kind of a, a learning state, you know, with, with, say, someone who wants to learn that instrument. How do you get yourself into the learning state and outside of just visualizing it and uh, never sitting down to do well, it? Well, to start with, if you're going to learn, depending upon what instrument it is, but like a stringed instrument, most people learn to not visualize seeing themselves do it because then you don't feel like you are. They instead see somebody playing a chord, turn the picture around and step inside it so that they can see the fretboard so they know exactly where to put their hand. And as the notes change, they see the fingers moving on the fretboard and they keep their hand inside it so that they make short movies so they learn little pieces and eventually make long movies. People like Mozart would listen to somebody play the piano and visualize his own hands on the keyboard and he'd memorize it and he could go home and play it. He had a very good eidetic memory for such things. But for the most of us, we have to start with small pieces and learn those pieces. But, you know, most people who have learned to play the guitar, they never tell you to visualize and imagine a keyboard or a fretboard and to put your hands on it and to see what your hands would look like in your mind and put your hand inside your own imagination and move it along. Because it's real-life pictures that get you to do real-life things. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's a programmed subtext of society or something subtly embedded in our school system, but a lot of people seem to be plagued with negative thoughts, and that seems to be a big roadblock. Um, well, yeah, but if you think about how much time it takes to have all these negative thoughts, that's the point at which if you start adding them up minute by minute, day by day, year by year, and you realize that you've, you've spent more time – thinking that you couldn't do something, then it actually takes to learn it. And I encounter this a lot. I, I get it with athletes. I get it with musicians. Some of the musicians I meet are making buckets of money, and they still don't feel talented. They still don't feel, and they always look at me and they go, that's because I never practice. But yet they spend three hours a day worrying about not practicing, when if they practiced for an hour a day, they'd be better off. But, you know, the fact that people do stupid things isn't the important issue. The important issue is starting to do what you want to do minute by minute, going, well, tomorrow I'll spend two and a half hours worrying about it and a half hour practicing. <laughs> as soon as you start to think of it as a practical decision and you think about the things that you actually do, think about how you do them in your mind, where are the pictures, what's the voice that gets you to do things. Most people don't really spend a lot of time thinking, but they do brush their teeth in the morning regularly. And if they stop and think about brushing their teeth, they have a mental program they run. There's no reason why you can't replace that with a guitar and practice for half an hour, you know, or clean your closet or anything else. You can make it a matter-of-fact thing if you just take the thought process that works and put what you want in it, as opposed to using a thought process that doesn't work and continually using it over and over again. Huh. Yeah, it's, it's seeming to make more sense. But let's talk a little bit about hypnosis before we have to get out of here, because um, that's the most visually impressive thing you do. And the only times we've ever talked about it on the show is for uh, fringe things like past life regression or recalling some alien abduction, um, not really in any type of uh, practical use for your life. But do you think hypnosis can be used for those more fringe things? Do you, what are they recalling if not a real past life or an alien abduction? Well, just let me be honest with mind? you. Uh, I saw some of the films on alien abductions, and uh, when they hypnotized the people, they literally said, you know, at 4 o'clock, how many aliens came through the wall? Ah, they're well, leaving in them. a trance, most people will accept any suggestion if you tell them to disappear a hot stove in the middle of a room 
and bring them out of trance and ask them to get you a book on the other side of the room, they will walk around the stove. And when you ask them why they walked around the side of the room, they'll say one leg is shorter than the others. Uh, people just make stuff up in trance. Uh, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you ask them about anything, it's very hard to use hypnosis to get accurate information unless you're highly skilled. When you're highly skilled, you can set up ways so that the unconscious is like on sodium pentothal. It just will only tell the truth. And if you set it up like that in the beginning, then you'll get accurate information. But if you just age regress people back to something which may or may not have happened and ask them to recall it, they'll make shit up like crazy. (laughs) And I don't know if there are alien abductions or not, but given the hypnotists that I've seen do it, we have no way of knowing for sure. Right. Uh, You know, it's just one of those things. Uh, To me, if somebody was abducted repeatedly, I would teach them to hypnotically and involuntarily reach up and rip their masks off because they always seem to have a mask off or poke somebody in the eye. Uh, You know, you can give people post-hypnotic suggestions and they will carry them out. In fact, most of the stupid things that people are doing are kind of like post-hypnotic suggestions. Think about this. Most people can set their alarm clock at night and will wake up just before it goes off. Yes. And and when I ask an audience, about 80% of the people will raise their hand when I ask how many of you uh, set an alarm clock and wake up before it goes off or don't set one at all and wake up at the time you imagine. Now, if 80% of the population can give themselves a suggestion and wake up from a dead sleep at at a particular moment, It means that, you know, they should be giving themselves more suggestions. They shouldn't just be saying, wake up at 8 o'clock. They should say, wake up happier, more determined, you know, wake up and clean your closet. Uh, You know, the same machine that will wake them up will do all kinds of things. We have all these wonderful machines in our mind that are designed to, to tell time, to carry out tasks, to remember things. And being able to organize them so that they function efficiently Uh, In hypnosis, we do it because we're given the suggestions. And part of where NLP came from is I started seeing people do things that I couldn't do. I mean, how is it possible I could hypnotize a girl, name off the notes on a piano, and then start hitting notes and having her tell me the name when she had no musical background? It means that, you know, and when I asked her, she told me the, the sounds were as different as colors. Uh, I had uh, Gregory Bateson, who is an English intellectual, who was one of my mentors years ago. Uh, He was married to Margaret Mead, and he popped over my house once when I was doing an experimental hypnosis group. And there was a young chap in a deep trance, and Gregory says to me, he goes, oh, he goes, make him talk backwards. And I I looked at him and I went, what? And he goes, you know, so the sound comes out backwards. So I looked at this kid and I said, you're in a deep trance. When you come out of this trance, you'll speak perfect backwards. And I woke him up and he looked out at us and he went, and Gregory spoke back to him. And they went back and forth for a few minutes. And then I put the kid back in a trance and I said, when you come out of trance this time, you're going to tell me exactly how you did this. And he he sat up and he looked at me and he goes, it was so easy. He said, all I did was write the sentence I wanted to say, then I wrote it phonetically underneath, and then I reversed the letters and sounded it out. Now, as soon as you have that strategy, anybody can talk backwards. Huh. So, I mean, it seems like the hypnotic state is just a state of, like, hyper-visualization, which is what we're trying to do with neurolinguistic programming in our waking life. It's just well, not as what we do with effect. NLP is we try to find a strategy, a series of internal states. It's not just visual. Sometimes it's auditory, sometimes kinesthetic, and sometimes a series of these things that allows us to reproduce a behavior, whether the behavior is talking backwards or hitting a baseball better or, you know, or memorizing a date. All of these things which we're capable of doing, there are little mental strategies that work better than other ones. Phonetics isn't a good strategy to spell because spelling by definition is where you repeat letters which are visual to start with. Uh, You know, every school system I've ever been in, every year hands kids a phonetic speller. 